This is Brother Peter Diamond, VaticanCatholic.com. Historian Warren H. Carroll, the founder of Christendom College, passed away a few days ago. I wanted to offer a few comments about that. Carroll was a widely respected figure in the Vatican II Church because he was a renowned historian and he wrote many books on Catholic history. And I've read almost all of his books. His books are quite valuable and interesting. However, and this is what I wanted to talk about, Carroll was unfortunately a modernist heretic who did not hold the real Catholic faith. And I wanted to give a few examples of how he departed from Catholic teaching, because there are many in his books. The first example I want to talk about comes in his book, The Glory of Christendom, the third volume in his series on a history of Christendom. And on page 340, he's discussing Pope Boniface VIII's solemn bull, Unum Sanctum, November 18, 1302. That bull can be accessed on the internet. It's also in Denzinger, the sources of Catholic dogma. After quoting this bull and the important part, which states that, quote, we declare, we proclaim, we define, that it is absolutely necessary for salvation that every human creature be subject to the Roman pontiff. After quoting that, Carroll says on page 340, quote, The great problem with this document comes in the last sentence. The last and worst example of Pope Boniface VIII's tendency to overstate. The rest of it is a clear, forthright, and effective exposition of the Hildebrandin doctrine of the place of the Pope in Christendom. But the last sentence sounds like a claim of universal sovereignty, temporal as well as spiritual, and also, though this was not an issue at the time, more than 200 years before the appearance of Protestantism, a solemn declaration that only practicing Catholics can be saved. In fact, Boniface VIII, as we have seen, had explicitly repudiated any claim to be a temporal ruler outside the papal state in this very year, and there is nothing whatever to indicate that he was even thinking of the doctrinally separate question of the salvation of persons who are not practicing Catholics. End quote. So he quotes this dogmatic statement from Pope Boniface VIII, and he refers to it as a, quote, great problem, and says that it's, quote, the worst example of Pope Boniface VIII's tendency to overstate, end quote. So he's criticizing a dogmatic definition. And there's no doubt that Pope Boniface VIII's statement is infallible and dogmatic. It was confirmed and repromulgated by Pope Leo X at the Fifth Lateran Council, and it was also referred to by Pope Pius XII in Mysticiu Corporis Christi as solemn. Yet, according to the renowned so-called Catholic historian Warren H. Carroll, it's problematic and overstated. That is obviously heretical, and it demonstrates that the so-called conservatives in the Vatican II Church, the most, quote, learned and well-informed, have departed from the real Catholic faith. And what's so interesting about this is, are we the only ones to point this out? Did anyone else read this book? Has anyone else brought this out? Did any of his friends bring this to his attention? Probably not, even if they were aware of it, because human respect is a way of life in heretical circles and especially in the Vatican II counterchurch. And so even if someone did come across this passage and had a problem with it, almost certainly they would have just brushed it aside and not worried about it and not said anything to Carol. And so obviously it's very sad to say, but Carol was actually a horrible heretic. Yet we have false traditionalists praising this man. In fact, one false traditionalist named Michael Matt, and it's just a joke that he actually claims to be a traditional Catholic, called Carol a, quote, soldier of Christ. Another example of heresy in the writings of Warren H. Carroll that I want to discuss comes in his book, The Rise and Fall of the Communist Revolution, a large work on the communist revolution in Russia. We cite it quite a bit in our article dealing with the consecration and conversion of Russia and what occurred in Russia. Very interesting book. On page 785 of that book, he's speaking about the people who were raised up against communism and he says, quote, Only to God could they now cry. And to God they did cry. God heard them, and raised up as rescuers humble men who still believed in him. Pope John Paul II, Lachwalenza, Father Gleb Yakunin, and his like, and the holy warriors of Afghanistan. End quote. 
So he's referring to the Islamic warriors in Afghanistan. He calls them holy. He says they believed in God, and he says God raised them up. So this is just heresy, pure religious indifferentism. It demonstrates that he completely denied the necessity of the church for salvation and embraced Vatican II apostate religious indifferentism. He utters a similar heresy on page XIII, or 13 of the preface. He refers to the Muslims who were crying, quote, Allahu Akbar, and he says they were, quote, brought to victory not by any means that men could fully measure, but by the Lord of hosts. Another example of heresy comes in volume 4 of his series on the history of Christendom. This is from the Cleaving of Christendom, page 611. He's talking about the Protestant revolutionaries in different parts of Europe, and he says, But in 1655 Christendom was irreparably cloven into Protestant and Catholic segments, with never the twain to meet. There was not and could not be any religious bridge between them, only secular, diplomatic, and trade relations. The very concept of Christendom lived on only in the Catholic segment. The Protestants still believed in the Incarnation, thereby unquestionably remaining Christians too. End quote. That is false. That is not consistent with Catholic teaching. Protestants, unfortunately, are not Christians. To be a Christian, you must accept Catholic teaching. As Pope Pius IX says in Etsy Multa No. 25 in 1873, Quote, the holy martyr Cyprian, writing about schism, denied to the pseudo-bishop Novatian even the title of Christian, on the grounds that he was cut off and separated from the Church of Christ. Whoever he is, he says, and whatever sort he is, he is not a Christian who is not in the Church of Christ. End quote. And St. Robert Bellarmine points out that all the fathers taught that a manifest heretic is not a Christian. St. Ambrose also says, quote, even the heretics appear to possess Christ, for none of them denies the name of Christ. Yet anyone who does not confess all that pertains to Christ does in fact deny Christ. End quote. Another example of heresy comes in his book, The Founding of Christendom, that's volume one of A History of Christendom, published by Christendom Press. On page 78 in footnote 42, he's referring to a rabbi named Solomon. He refers to the rabbis quote, deep faith and sound scholarship. So he's praising the, quote, deep faith of a Jewish rabbi who rejects Jesus Christ. On page 97 of the same book, in footnote 25, he calls into question the accuracy of the biblical account. He says, quote, recent archaeological evidence from Ashdod casts some doubt on the biblical account of the fall of the idol of the male god Dagon, since only a mother goddess seems to have been worshipped in the city at this period. End quote. So he's casting doubt on the accuracy of the biblical account. Perhaps he agreed with Benedict XVI's recent book, Jesus of Nazareth, Holy Week, in which Benedict XVI says that Matthew 27:25 is not historically accurate. In other words, Benedict XVI says that Matthew's gospel is flat out wrong. But all of that, of course, is contrary to Catholic teaching on the inerrancy of Scripture. There are many other examples of heresy that one could bring up in the writings of Carroll. It's sad to say because he spent so much of his life researching Catholic history and related matters. It's another example of how if you do not dedicate yourself to the faith and to God with purity of intention, much labor will not profit you in the end. He's another victim of the Vatican to apostasy and the heresies against the dogma outside the church. There is no salvation. Nevertheless, his books have a tremendous amount of value. They're extremely well written and well researched, and people can learn a great deal from them.